Is it 10 billion or 13 billion in the United States alone that was employed in this, what else can you call it, PSYOPs campaign to coerce, compel, and mandate that we accept an unlicensed product that turns out to not be safe nor effective? Today I sit down with mRNA vaccine pioneer Dr. Robert Malone, author of the new book, Lies My Government Told Me, and the better future coming. Elon now is in the position where he has access to incredibly damaging information about the willingness of the US government to collude with industry and compromise the First Amendment. We dive into information warfare, psychological operations, and how we can make sense of the bewildering series of events we've witnessed in the last three years. Your mind and your thoughts, your very emotions, are the battleground. It is not about territory. It's about what you believe. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Dr. Robert Malone, such a pleasure to have you back on American Thought Leaders. Jan, it's, it's been my enduring pleasure to have these chats with you from time to time. It's, it always forces me to think more about things before I walk into your studio. Well, let, let's talk about something that seems to be on everybody's mind right now, which is Twitter, of course. <laughs> and you've said that Twitter isn't a business, it's a weapon. So what does that mean? This is an essay we put out a couple of months ago before Elon uh, transformed the company in the way that he has. Twitter is one embodiment, uh, as, as we all know now, of multiple social media platforms in which ostensibly um, what you interact with you believe to be free. And as has been pointed out repeatedly, if you don't know who's paying for it, you're the product. And the information that you provide is the value that's being extracted. All of these social media platforms are actively employed by intelligence community to uh, shape opinion, uh, to truly shape thought, to shape emotion. And Twitter, it's clear now, has become the premium platform for uh, shaping uh, emerging global consensus about the topics of the day. And in the case of Twitter, what triggered me to write this article was an analysis that had been done. The authors speculated that Twitter was deployed during Arab Spring. As I was reading that section, um, it triggered me because I knew that Twitter had been deployed during Arab Spring as a weapon. And it's often the case in our kind of military industrial intelligence complex world here in the United States that we have a history of of piloting uh, weapons platforms uh, during uh, um, peripheral skirmishes that are occurring in, in our kind of imperial world uh, that we operate here uh, out of Washington, D.C. Uh, in, in the case of Arab Spring, you'll recall that we had a lot of young crowds moving and acting um, in ways that were uh, very disruptive, we'll just say disruptive. Then we're not placing value on, you know, this person versus that person. They were just disruptive. Twitter was, I knew that Twitter was deployed then because I had a client at the time that uh, was deeply, deeply involved in both uh, non-classified and classified research into uh, being able to map the emotional content of uh, language being used by individuals on social media platforms. It's a multilingual program that uh, analyzes emotional content of language. It's a form of, of language processing uh, based on well-established psychological uh, parameters. So it's all statistically grounded. And I was also working for a company, TASC, it's a beltway bandit here, uh, in, um, in a senior position having to do with business development. And they had their own platforms that also were being developed for uh, defense and uh, um, intelligence communities to perform similar functions. So what I'm referring to here is that with modern social media platforms, one is able to uh, obviously extensively map relationship clouds uh, and, and also to map uh, 
the uh, consensus within a relationship cloud about a given topic, uh, where that consensus is moving, who's driving it, who's at the fringes of that cloud that are the influencers that are dragging it in this direction or that direction. Uh, and um, uh, the social media platforms, the technology that we're all familiar with as individuals, and we use this language like, I've been shadow banned, okay? I've been deplatformed. I can't get the reach that I thought I could get. Or, oh, suddenly that tweet went really viral and a whole bunch of people saw it. And, oh, that's so great. You know, they all agree with me. That is grossly naive to think that way. The way that these tools, these weapons, information warfare weapons work, is that um, uh, those controlling them can modulate the messaging that's occurring within these influencer clouds that can be readily mapped. And in fact, all the members of that influencer cloud can be physically mapped in space, particularly if they're using a cellular device in an urban center, because you have multiple cell towers that can triangulate them. And that then maps into what's called Gorgon Stare, which is this incredible high resolution imaging capability that we now have in spy satellites. So your um, current state of mind, based on the language that you're using and the topics that you're talking about, can be mapped very precisely, psychologically. Uh, it can be tied into a web of influence relationships. Uh, it can be uh, identified um, in geospatial uh, environments. It can be tied to physical images so that uh, um, that can be tied to what is the vehicle you're driving? Who do you get into that vehicle with? Who are you traveling with? Who are you associating with? All these things can now be totally integrated and mapped. And um, by using these tools of manipulating what information, what tweets you put out, what messages you put out um, to your influencer cloud, they can modulate how those people behave you can actually very actively control what individuals are thinking, the information that they're gathering, what they're being influenced to do. So a crowd that is in a plaza um, uh, protesting against some action that's happened during Arab Spring can be modulated to go this direction physically or that direction or intellectually or psychologically very readily using these tools. With, without, and I'll just jump in, without realizing that there's any manipulation actually happening. Precisely. And that, that is the essence of this kind of information warfare, um, psychological operations. And one word that's coming, one phrase that's coming to fore more and more is uh, fifth generation warfare or fifth generation warfare gradient is a better way to think about it. Um, this new uh, battleground in which your mind and your thoughts, your very emotions are, are the battleground. It is not about territory. It's about what you believe. It's what you think. And with these tools, that can be actively crafted, modified, manipulated in a very sophisticated way and then propagated within the domain of those that you are influencing which is why there's so much importance in targeting those that are, um, let's say, hyper-influential within a cloud of, of connectivity. So then what is the significance of Elon Musk uh, taking over Twitter and what has transpired in your mind, given everything you've just told me? Early on before the acquisition, when there was still all this discussion about how many of the Twitter users were actually bots or um, synthetic users, uh, not true individuals. Uh, there was much discussion about the business model that was driving the acquisition. And this relates to the envisioned company X, uh, a name that apparently Elon has bought back from PayPal. And for instance, to, to kind of illustrate an angle in this, you recall that Elon recently discussed in some of his tweets, uh, I don't know how his board is letting him get away with it, by the way, he must have total control, um, that 
they're building a new alternative to PayPal. What he indicated early on was the intended business model was more akin to WeChat, in which uh, Twitter or whatever Twitter becomes, let's call it X for the sake of argument, uh, um, becomes kind of one ring to rule them all. The universal application. The universal application through which you'll do your banking, your commercial transactions, buy your groceries, have your social media transactions, everything. Okay, that's that's the logic that was purported uh, underlying the acquisition. And so from that, the importance of understanding the true user base becomes crucial because that is um, something that is a commodity. You know, your or my being on Twitter uh, represents a potential node that has uh, commercial transactions that could be monetized. Okay, so um, what do we have here? I'm not sure, and I think a lot of people are kind of on the fence. Uh, certainly, I think we can all celebrate uh, Elon's willingness to be uh, transparent and uh, demonstrate integrity in disclosing the intense, almost casual, routine interaction between the intelligence community, particularly the FBI, and Twitter. That, that in, in these recent Twitter files that have come out, uh, clearly demonstrates how closely integrated Twitter was as a weapon uh, for forming um, public opinion and manipulating public opinion and reinforcing the, the intended public opinion and consensus. Uh, but what's behind that? And, and where is he really going with this? This gentleman that is one of the major defense contractors to the United States, SpaceX, among other platforms, uh, and uh, is advancing this uh, clearly transhumanist uh, technology that we call Neuralink. What is really um, in behind Elon Musk's business decisions? And, and I, you know, a lot of people get caught up in the uh, enthusiasm of Elon Musk being a savior of uh, democracy and free speech. And uh, that may be one of his motivations. I can't get in his head. I don't know what he's thinking. But I do know that he is a business person. And I do know that he's been a very successful business person as well as a very successful technologist. And uh, it's hard for me to imagine uh, that he would have invested, what's the number, 40 billion? 44, um, I think. Yeah, yeah, 44 billion, and which is a substantial fraction is clearly not his capital. Okay, so somebody is out there that has decided to deploy a major chunk of change, invest a lot of treasure in acquiring this thing, which um, uh, whether intentional or not, puts Elon in a position where he's functionally able to blackmail the United States government. Now that's a big word. Uh, it has a lot of impact. But I'm reminded of J. Edgar Hoover, who used to keep his little black book, where he had dirt on a lot of people here in DC. And then of course we had this honey trap operation that we called Jeffrey Epstein and Maxwell, that was clearly uh, a, an intelligence honey trap operation to compromise people. And uh, Elon now is in the position where he has access to incredibly damaging information about the willingness of the US government to collude with industry and compromise the First Amendment. And uh, remember, this is a court case being brought by the two attorneys general. Um, and they have just been given a huge gift. It basically makes their case. Uh, so um, I found it fascinating that Janet Yellen a few weeks ago was talking about the need to evaluate um, the potential antitrust implications of Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Elon doesn't have any other social media platforms. So Janet Yellen basically starts saber rattling. Uh, and a week later, uh, Elon Musk starts deploying uh, intelligence about collusion between the US government and Twitter to censor people on a routine basis. I'm just trying to make the point 
that there are wheels within wheels within wheels here. I can't ferret them out. I don't think you can either. We're, we're left here on the sidelines observing the passion play, observing the Kabuki theater, uh, and trying to discern meaning out of these little fragments of information which are being selectively released and deployed. And, and we also know now that a, a major democratic operative, a tr uh, lawyer, was busy filtering all that information until fairly recently, uh, unbeknownst to Elon Musk. So like I'm saying, there are wheels within wheels within wheels on this. And I don't, you know, Elon doesn't call me up. He called up, he, he contacted Jay Bhattacharya, right? Uh, two Sundays ago uh, to go into Twitter HQ and start reviewing um, uh, COVID files. So I'm not talking to him. Nobody in my close circle has direct personal communication on a routine basis with him. I don't know what he's thinking, but I do know that he is a very intelligent individual. I know that he is very strategic. Uh, and if he's doing things uh, in this space to advance uh, free speech and essentially to protect democracy, um, or protect the integrity of the American experiment. Um, I, I applaud that. I thank him for it from the bottom of my heart. Whatever his intentions are, if that's the outcome, one of the outcomes, it's a win. But I don't think any of us should be so naive as to assume that that is his only objective. One of the things that struck me, and I've written a little bit about this, uh, is, is the, the gift, the thing that I think the gift that Elon has given uh, everyone is he has a substantial following. There's a lot of people that love Elon, right? And a bunch of haters. And, and, and certainly a bunch of haters. But, but here's the thing, okay? This corporate media ecosystem and so forth, you know, is started all of a sudden hating Elon, right? When they were either neutral or very positive to him for the vast majority of, of, of the opportunity they had to do it. Tesla stock so, tank. Tesla stock tank. So my point is that all these people are now watching how this whole ecosystem has shifted on this guy, right? And wondering to themselves, wait a second, has this could maybe this has happened before? You know, this is a, it's like this giant red pill. I that's what I think. I have a friend that corresponds with me that uh, makes the case that uh, the um, it's actually Alex Marinos, um, uh, you know, a, a key opinion leader in this uh, social media space. Uh, and uh, just a shout out, I'm grateful because he endorsed that. Yes, in fact, the data do support my thesis that uh, I was the original uh, inciting event inventor for this technology platform. Put that aside, Alex makes the case that Elon goes through these love-hate cycles about every two to three years and has been doing so for quite a long time. Hmm. And uh, he, his thesis, among others, is that um, he repeatedly a battered and bruised Bill Gates, um, he basically outmaneuvered him uh, on uh, Tesla stock and other things, and with SpaceX also, uh, beat the expectations. So there's, there's this long history of him uh, going through these hero villain cycles in, in corporate media, uh, and that, that uh, appears to reflect uh, underlying tensions within this caste that I like to call the overlords, uh, this tiny, tiny fraction of elite that are, we can increasingly see, seem to control a lot of global events. Uh, and what we may be really observing are the artifacts of uh, competition, technological and financial between um, these heavy, heavy hitters that are so far above uh, the world that you and I exist in that we only have a vague kind of cloud awareness that they're up there doing something.